Welcome back to Shattery Miss. I want to turn our attention to the Torah, to uh, Barashith, to the fourth uh, encounter between Yahweh and uh, Abraham and Sarah. Uh, in yesterday's program, we uh, uh, began to listen to what God had to say to Abraham regarding his wife. His wife's name at the time was Sarai. It means uh, princess. God wanted him to change his wife's name to call her by a different name because now just as Abraham had his name changed from uh, uh, uplifting father to merciful loving and enriching father from uh, Abram to Abraham God wanted uh, Sarah's name changed too in conjunction with the covenant so that the role that our spiritual mother plays would also be conveyed. Now, our spiritual father is merciful. He is loving. He is enriching. He is uplifting. Now, all of those are conveyed by Abraham. And so with the change from Sarai to Sarah, uh, which means to uh, engage, to endure, to persist, to persevere, to empower, and to uh, liberate, uh, God is saying that's the role of our spiritual mother as it relates to the covenant, just as through Abraham the role of our heavenly father is communicated. So here's the passage where God says, God said to uh, Abraham, uh, Sarai, your wife, you shall not, uh, shall not call her by that name, Sarai, but instead Sarah shall be her name. Now, God is is positioning Sarah as an extraordinarily important individual relative to the covenant, just as is Abraham. So if, if we want to understand the role of our Heavenly Father and spiritual mother relative to participating in the covenant, we ought to examine that name and consider how it differs than the previous name. Now, Princess uh, suggests that uh, she is, uh, has uh, earthly authority human authority. Uh, she was born into the right uh, um, home or, uh, or lineage in terms of human uh, authority. But uh, uh, the, the Sarah concept, which is the middle of Israel, individuals who engage and endure with God, talk about being enriched, talk about being empowered. Talk about engaging, which is what we need to do to participate in the covenant. Talking about enduring, which is the benefit of the covenant. We endure with God. We're empowered by Him, and we are liberated by Him. The whole purpose of, again, becoming a child of the covenant and participating in, uh, in the Torah's teaching regarding the covenant is we're liberated. Uh, it's not an enslaving document. The opposite is true. So God continued to say, and I choose of my own volition to kneel down and bless through her. And also I will literally give you a son from her. So the first statement is God is, is positioning himself as he really is. As a father who is willing to get down on his knees, Barak chooses to get down on his knees to lift us up. That is the way God positions himself. The notion of us getting down on our knees to lift God up is the religious perspective. One is right, the other is wrong. It is God who kneels down in love to us so that he, as our Father, can lift us up. And he chooses to do so. This is his will. This is his desire. And it's not just that he is going to bless her. He's going to bless through her. It, the... The uh, word that God used here was F, and he, uh, he ascribed the third person, singular, feminine pronoun to F, as opposed to just using uh, the pronoun for her. And so he is, says that he's going to bless with her, he's going to bless through her, uh, and that's what F conveys. And also he says, I will literally give you a son from her. So, it is through our recognition of what Sarah represents in the covenant, in his marriage relationship with Abraham, uh, and, and how that equates to the covenant, that we receive the benefits of the covenant. Uh, and one of those benefits is children. Uh, God created the covenant because he wants to have children. He wants to enjoy 
the uh, children in a family environment. Just as, as I enjoyed taking my children on camping trips and exploring, God, too, enjoys these things. That was Barashith 17.16. Then God reaffirms, wants us to make sure we get this picture, because this picture is the only picture that really enables us to properly understand the role God plays in our lives, the one that he wants to play in our lives. He says, and I want to kneel down and favor her. She shall be a way to reach out to, to approach individuals from different races and places, Goyim. An empowered and authorized family shall come to exist through her. The continuation of Barashith in the beginning, Genesis 1716. So here God is affirming that, that as our Heavenly Father, his role for, on behalf of his covenant children is to get down on his knees to lift us up. And that that is a benefit for us. And that through the mother of the covenant, which is now Sarah, is a um, is symbolic of our spiritual mother, the set-apart spirit, the Ruach Kodesh, that through her, uh, God's going to get down in love to lift us up. It's a way to reach out to, to approach law, goyim. And it, God could have used... Um, Yisrael here, God could have used Jacob here, God could have used just the, the singular name of Ishmael, who is the, I mean not Ishmael, but, uh, but Dishak, laughter, the first child of the covenant. He could have said, I'm going to say, am I going to bless you, Abraham? No. He didn't use any of those terms. He used the term that is inclusive of all people in all places, all races, Goyim. And so Sarah is being presented as a means that, an implement, if you will, an individual that God is going to use to reach out to and to favor individuals of all different races in every place on earth. The way that he's going to favor is what is explained next. The benefit that he is offering the means that he's going to be used to reach out to people is an empowered and authorized Malachim family, Am. That's the covenant family. And he's saying that the covenant family is going to come to exist through her. And she bore a son, uh, Yishak. And then Yishak gave birth to Jacob, and Jacob became Yisrael. And those who are naturally born into the covenant are descendants of Jacob and therefore Yisrael. Well, God has already gone into great detail of how those of us who wish to be adopted into his family come to, uh, to benefit in that way. He goes on. And then Abraham fell on his face and he laughed, saying to himself, what is the point or purpose of a son being born to a hundred-year-old? And what of Sarah? How is a 90-year-old female going to conceive and bear a child? I, um, I like this for a lot of reasons. It uh, tells us, first of all, that uh, Abraham was uh, was gradually coming to understand but yet he he was not the sharpest implement in the uh, shed that uh, um, he had been shown heaven he had met now this is the fourth time with God he had uh, been um, offered all of these marvelous promises by God himself and now he's laughing at God and make no mistake he's laughing at God uh, now, you might say, why would I like that? And the reason I like that is that if Abraham became the father of the covenant, if Abraham has this special relationship with God, if God went out of his way to pick this man to engage in a relationship uh, with him, and this guy had the audacity to laugh at God, if this guy said, you know, okay, God, I know you took me to heaven, you showed me the magnificent universe and, and the light of the stars, 
but I'm uh, I just don't get it. You know, I don't understand what you're offering me here in a uh, as a uh, as a son. I'm a hundred. My wife's uh, ninety. Have you lost your mind? If a flawed individual like that, with incomplete reasoning, um, endeared himself to God, then there's hope for me, because I'm flawed. I have huge limitations in terms of my ability to understand and to process information. So uh, it uh, it means that God is not trying to save perfect people. It means that God is not trying to uh, create a family of perfect people. It doesn't mean that God. It means that God's not trying to reach out to and and find the the smartest person, the uh, the nicest person, the uh, most intelligent person. He's just reaching out to people as we are, just regular people, people like you and me. Now, what God does with regular people is extraordinary, but we start off as just regular men and women. This is kind of as, uh, what it tells you here is that as God met with uh, Abraham in these meetings where he manifest self, manifested himself as a, a human to interact with uh, Abraham, that God was not imposing. You know, God could have been a thousand foot tall, as brilliant as the sun. He could have had a voice that was booming. He could have just performed all manner of, of miracles. You know, he could have adorned old Abe in the most glorious attire. You know, he could have provided fireworks beyond imagination. But obviously he didn't. He approached Abraham in human form. Nothing to impress anyone. His uh, conversations with Abraham were, were just that, shared words. God was performing miracles all over the place to, to create this situation where that Abraham would be awed, where Abraham would be, uh, would be intimidated. And so Abraham felt comfortable enough with God, meeting directly with him, that he was willing to say, God, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? And fall down on his face laughing at him. Now that tells us a great deal about God, does it not? We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to Shattering Miss. We're uh, considering this uh, enormously uh, important uh, interaction between uh, Yahweh and Abraham. It not only demonstrates that Yahweh approached Abraham in a uh, uh, in a humble way, that God's uh, relationship as he manifest himself in Abraham's presence was not imposing. It wasn't to instill fear. It wasn't designed to to lord over. It wasn't designed to impress. It wasn't designed to in any way create a, a perspective by which Abraham would say, wow, that is, uh, that is God. I'm a nobody. Uh, this is really kind of uh, scary and imposing. No. And that's exactly the way I see God. Now, I may be too comfortable for most people uh, in this regard. Uh, I don't put God on a pedestal. I don't even refer to him as God all that often, uh, other than just, you know, as a, a use his title and, and comes up in writing. I view him as dad, my heavenly father. I view myself as his son, with all of the rights and privileges and the benefits that go along with being his son. I view our relationship as one where he wants to be friends, that he wants to be buds, that he wants to explore together, he wants to have fun together, he wants to camp out together. And so as I view our relationship, I view it the same way I viewed my relationship with, with my sons when I got to take them camping. And man, I want to tell you, I loved it. And 
and uh, I viewed myself when I took my son's camping as uh, as participating and enjoying this with them and lord over them and try to be imposing. Now I carried more than my share of the uh, of the load. I did more than my share of the work because the more that I contributed, the more enjoyable it was seeing the thrill of of backpacking and camping out on my son's faces. I love the experience. I see our relationship, my relationship personally. I don't want to dictate what do you all should uh, should think, but that's how I see my relationship with Yahweh. Is we're friends, we're buds. That that God's whole idea is that He's most comfortable when we're comfortable around Him. That He's happiest when we engage with Him in a way that doesn't put Him up on a pedestal. That just approach Him as Dad, as we would a best friend. You know, with my uh, my sons, we've made a transition. You know, when, when they were very young, uh, they were dependent upon all the things that I was providing, my wife and I was providing as mother and father, in terms of their food, their shelter, their clothing, their instruction, their protection, everything. But now that both of our sons have moved out and they're independent and they, they have their own jobs and they have their own homes, they have their lives, um, the role really is, uh, is um, twofold. We're still parents. When our children need help, we're there to help them. I mean instantly. And happy to do so. Thrilled to do so. And we still occasionally provide some parental advice. You never get too old for that. But for the most part, we're friends. We're friends. We're going to go here in a a little over a a week or so, and we're going to go off to um, on a vacation together. And... Both sons are going to join my wife and I, along with my eldest son's wife, and we're going to have a wonderful time on vacation, enjoying one another's company. But it's friends. It's a marvelous way to transition and grow in that relationship, and that's what I see in terms of the relationship that is being conveyed between Yahweh and Abraham and how I've my perspective on the same relationship. If God was imposing, Abraham would not have fell on his face and laughed. If um, God was uh, thin-skinned, if God was was insecure, if God was the kind of a deity that wanted to be worshipped and wanted man to bow down to him, the act of falling on his face and laughing and questioning God would have instantly ended Abraham's life. If the Torah requires us to be perfect to be saved. Mocking God in this way would have absolutely disqualified Abraham. But God's already said, you know, that he views Abraham as, as perfect, completely vindicated, righteous. And yet Abraham is capable of this. That means that Abraham was free to even mock God, to laugh at God. Once you're a child of the covenant, you have enormous freedom. Now, was it smart to laugh at God? No. But did Abraham get by with it? Was he free to do so? Absolutely. Now, isn't that extraordinary? The the very fact that this story is being told to us, being passed on to us by the only eyewitness at the scene, Yahweh himself, is telling us an enormous amount about the covenant, who God is, and what he's like. So here's Abraham for a second time falling on his face. Now the last time, God says, get up, Abraham. Look at me. Look up. And uh, here I am. Uh, If you want to have a relationship, get off of your your face. Now here he's falling down laughing. Uh, Again, the very fact that there's only two witnesses to this uh, discussion, and there's only one of them that could have passed this story on to us, and it's Yahweh. And for God to say that, that he formed his covenant with a fellow that laughed at him, that mocked him, that ridiculed him, um, reveals so much about the character and nature of God and the, uh, the kind of relationship he wants with us 
and the fact that um, the covenant is for flawed people. That it's flawed people who are invited to participate in the covenant. Now, we're not flawed once uh, God is done with us, but uh, you know, most of what He's going to do for us, He does for us in eternity, not uh, not in this life. He obviously, when He said that. Abraham was righteous. And this is really an important point. And way back there, you know, when Abraham says, you know, God, I don't get it. I have no idea what you're offering me. I don't have a son. And since I don't have a son, I don't know why you're talking about inheritance. What good is inheritance uh, for a guy as old as I am uh, if he doesn't have a son? So I don't get what you're talking about. And God took him to uh, to heaven showed him what heaven was going to be like, showed him how his inheritance was that he was going to be transformed into energy, to be a light-based being. And then uh, Abraham came back and says, I get it. I trust and rely on uh, on you. And God immediately says, and therefore, I, I based on this, you are righteous. You are vindicated. You are innocent. Perfect in God's uh, views. Now, that statement when you've got now Abraham falling down on his face, laughing at God, saying, what's the purpose of this, and mocking God in this regard, uh, questioning God in this regard, uh, disregarding God, now obviously not showing trust and reliance upon God, tells us an enormous amount about the nature of this relationship. So there would be those that would say, well, you know, okay, so you've, you've uh, embraced the terms and conditions of the covenant, then you go off and you start to, uh, to question. Well, that's what Abraham did. Was he excluded from the covenant? No. All right, so you're, uh, you're in a relationship with God. God says that I'm perfecting you. Uh, that's the benefit of matzah, that we are now uh, perfect in, uh, in God's eyes. Does that make us perfect as humans? Well, look what Abraham just did. No. Look at Dode, David, you know, and all the stuff that he did wrong, even though he was vindicated from a spiritual point of view with Yahweh as part of his family. This tells us that our human behavior is not the determining factor as to whether or not God views us as vindicated. It's all about our attitude, our willingness to trust and rely on him. And it itself doesn't have to be perfect, and it itself doesn't have to be always consistent you know it's it also answers the question of once a member of the covenant always a member of the covenant once saved always saved um, we have been given enormous freedom is what this uh, testament testimony reveals in the torah through the torah and in the covenant that we can can do things that are not Appropriate. And this is about as inappropriate as it gets. In fact, I don't think there's anything you could do more inappropriate than what Abraham just did. He's not laughing along with God. He's laughing at God. He's not asking a, a probing question. He's questioning God's capacity, capability, intent, purpose. I don't think there's anything you could do that's worse than this. God didn't zap him. He was a member of the covenant, therefore he's God's child. He's simply going to encourage him to get up and let's move on. Let's make the best of this. It's, um, it's why God speaks of the Torah as being so liberating, so uplifting, so enormously empowering, so beneficial. And then Abraham fell on his face and he laughed, saying to himself, what's the point or purpose? of a son being born to a hundred year old and what of Sarah how is a ninety year old female going to conceive and bear a child then Abraham said to God the Almighty why not Ishmael why not Ishmael who uh, hears God living and being restored to your presence that's what he um, said. He uh, he not only questioned God, he says, you know, God, i got another plan. i got another idea. What about my idea? This is the uh, the notion that, you know, Christians have that that um, uh, God's not going to be um, 
uncompromising in this regard that God's going to listen to our variations and if our variations make sense to us and if they uh, make us feel good that God's going to accept our alterations of his plan? Now, we're soon going to see what God has to say about uh, our suggestions relative to changing his approach. So here's Abraham saying, it's laughable, not going to happen. I don't believe you. Uh, I th- I'm making a mockery of you. And then Abraham says, okay, I'm going to try to bail God out here. That's like religion. I'm going to bail God out here. That's like Paul. I don't like that with that uh, God offered. I think it's craziness. God's obviously, obviously incompetent of delivering on those promises. So you know, that God of the flesh is going to actually have a, a, uh, a fleshy union between two uh, old farts and that they're going to conceive a child. Come on, that's of the flesh. That's silly. Let's come up with a better plan. So here's Abraham saying, I got a better plan. I got an idea, God. How about this? Why not Ishmael? How about him living and being restored to your presence? Well, God uh, didn't think that was an idea, good idea. You know what God's answer was? He wasn't saying, hey, hey, you know, you're my bud. Why not? I'll consider it. You know, your plan of, uh, of relationship and salvation really um, seems to have merit. So I'm going to accept your plan, and let's reject my plan. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go with your way. No. What this does, by the way, is say that Paul's, but I say, after Paul uh, destroys the credibility of the Torah, that Paul's, but I say is a non-starter. That God does not accept man's replacements for his instructions. God has a plan. He has guided us to a understanding of that plan. He has provided the instruction we need to know who he is and what he is offering. And God's not going to change his plan. Abraham said, what about Ishmael? What a great idea that would be. Why don't you do this through him? But God said, no, absolutely not. A ball. To the contrary, strongly communicating and completely contrasting denial while expressing the correct conclusion in an assertive and authoritative voice which leaves nothing to question. But God said, absolutely not. Now, here's Abraham. He is, he is an important dude. He is the father of the covenant. He is the person with whom God initially called out of Babylon, took to the promised land, made all of the most marvelous promises in the universe that he would become immortal, that he would become perfect, that he would become uh, adopted into his God's family, that he would be enriched, that he would be empowered. All of the benefits of the covenant being offered to this guy, and this guy comes up with a plan B. And God says, absolutely not. So if Paul, who studied to be a rabbi, whom Yosha despised, if... Uh, Paul, who said that, admitted that he was demon possessed, if Paul, who hated every aspect of the Torah, so if Paul, who specifically said that this covenant was established with Ishmael through Hagar and that it was enslaving, when God said the opposite. So if Paul, could con- who contradicted God, annulling everything that God said, came up with a plan B, salvation through grace and the gospel of grace, salvation through faith and the gospel of grace, if Paul came up with a plan B under that basis, and he is vastly less important to Yahweh, what do you think the odds are that God accepted Paul's premise when he rejected Abraham's. And God said, absolutely not. No way. I won't even consider it. Not a chance in the universe.
So there you go. Now, the reason this is particularly important, too, if you happen to be a, uh, a Christian, is that the fulcrum of Pauline doctrine is presented in the heart of his first letter, the letter to the Galatians, where Paul says that the, co- that the covenant which was ratified on Mount Sinai, which is the Torah. So the Torah, the covenant presented in the Torah, this very covenant that we're looking at, was with Ishmael, was with um, Hagar, which means Ishmael, that God accepted Abraham's uh, suggestion here, and that the covenant was formed with Ishmael, and therefore, since Hagar was a slave, it is about enslaving, and that that is why Paul came up with an entirely different covenant one which was spiritual as opposed to of the flesh. Now, when you listen to what God had to say here, that's not only not true, the opposite is true. And that's the basis of Pauline doctrine. That's the basis of the religion of Christianity. On this point, Christianity is torn asunder. It is proven to be unreliable. God then said, Sarah, Your wife shall deliver a child to be your son, and you shall call his name accordingly Yishak, which, my friends, means laughter. In the name of that child, God defined the purpose of the covenant. He explained to all of us that he is accepting of flawed individuals and that his goal with such flawed rascals is to have a good time. He, too, wants to enjoy a good laugh. We'll be back with the last segment after the commercial break. Welcome back to Shattering Myths. So here we have Yahweh denouncing the premise of Christianity. Uh, You read Paul's letter to the Galatians, and I would encourage you, if you have not read it, to go to questioningpaul.com, questioningpaul.com. It's a thousand-page analysis of Paul's initial letter that to the Galatians. And the fulcrum of that letter is that the covenant that was ratified in the uh, the Torah uh, is based upon Hagar, not to Sarah, and that uh, because Hagar was a slave, it enslaves, and therefore a new covenant had to be created, and the new covenant, rather than being of the flesh, was going to be of the spirit, and it was became known as Paul's gospel of grace. That is completely destroyed. If you, if you believe Paul, then you have to disregard Yahweh. But since Paul said that the covenant in the Torah was based upon Hagar, when God says exactly the opposite in the Torah, you can't believe Paul. You can't be informed and rational and believe Paul. It, the only way to accept Paul, and therefore Christianity, is to be ignorant and irrational. That's it. No other way. So to be a Christian... Because Christianity is based upon the premise that Paul outlined in his letter to the Galatians. The only way to be a Christian is to be ignorant and irrational. That might sound harsh, but that's the reality. The opposite of what Paul claimed to be true is actually true. The opposite. Sarah, your wife, shall deliver a child. Not Hagar. Sarah, your wife. Can Ishmael be the basis of the covenant? God said absolutely no. Sarah, your wife, shall deliver a child to be your son, and you shall call his name accordingly Yishak, which is the Hebrew word for laughter. It means individual or one who laughs, who jeffs, who has fun, who plays. The first child accepted in the covenant was named for its purpose. We are entertaining to God. We amuse him. We bring a smile to his face. We make Yahweh happy. He enjoys getting to know us. We cause God to laugh and to have a good time. The covenant is for laughter. God continued to say, And I will stand up and establish, accordingly, my family-oriented covenant relationship with him for the purpose of an 
eternal and everlasting family-oriented covenant relationship with and on behalf of his offspring after him. Again, every aspect of God's own testimony is in conflict with every religion. Here's Yahweh saying that he himself is going to take the stand, that he himself is going to establish. Kum is the word that we find in the the so popular Camp uh, fire song, Kumbaya. Kumbaya means stand with Yah. Kum is to stand. God is saying, I'm going to take the stand. I'm going to stand up to establish. Kum. I want to completely restore and raise up. I want to totally fulfill and accomplish. I desire to encourage and I will ratify and confirm accordingly my covenant relationship with him. Yishak. Not Ishmael. Kum was scribed in the Hiffel stem. In the Hiffel stem, the subject becomes a full participant in the action. And so God is establishing his covenant, and God's covenant is establishing. That's the beauty of the Hiffel stem. It makes the object a full participant along with the subject in the action of the verb. So God is establishing his covenant, and his covenant is establishing us. So much can be learned when we understand the Hebrew stems. It was written in the perfect conjugation, which says that God's stand on behalf of his covenant is going to be total and complete. Nothing more needs to be done. And it says that the covenant's ability as a as the second subject, the covenant's ability to establish is total and complete. Then in the consecutive form, it reveals that this is God's will. This is what he wants to do. This is what he has chosen to do. This is the purpose of the covenant itself. All of that is being conveyed when God says, I will stand up, I choose to establish accordingly my covenant so that it can establish with him for the purpose of an eternal and everlasting family covenant relationship. We'll continue tomorrow. May God bless.